Welcome to this week's Australian Water School webinar. We're so glad you could join us. It's called Rain on Grid in HECRAS Modelling and presented by Craig Price, Mark Forrest and Chris Goodell. My name is Trevor Piller. I'm the National Partnerships Manager from IceWarm and uh, we present Australian Water School training. Look at that array across the globe there. Isn't that just something? Unprecedented interest. And um, it's obviously an important issue that there are challenges in this critical area of modelling rainfall. Uh, you can see there on the screen that there's a ton of free webinars coming up, uh, some online courses. For today, three professionals in HECRAS are going to speak to us. And um, that's Cray Price from Surface Water Solutions. Cray's a civil engineer and a project manager with international water experience. It's Craig there now, thank you. And uh, also Mark from HDR Engineering. Mark has 34 years experience in water resources engineering. Uh, and also Chris Goodell should be on board there. Thanks, Chris. Hi, uh, these three gentlemen. Chris has, has over 21 years experience. He's from Klein Schmidt Associates. Associates. And um, this is a vast array of international experience. We, we've got it together in one place today. And we're absolutely glad you could uh, join us, gentlemen. Thanks so much. Uh, Chris uh, in Oregon, uh, Cray there in Western Australia, and Mark in Texas. We're looking forward so much to this, Cray, Mark, and Chris. Uh, thank you once again. I'll hand right over to you, Cray, and you will hand, I guess, over to Mark. Sounds good. Thanks very much. Okay, if we can see that, um, we're ready to get started. I'm, I'm just going to spend about uh, 10, 10 to 15 minutes here going through the mechanics of HECRAS and how you do rain on grid modeling in HECRAS, how easy it is to do rain on grid modeling in HECRAS, and then Mark's going to cover why it's much more difficult to actually get meaningful results out of rain on grid models. Um, we'll, we'll dive straight into, uh, I guess, with the definition of hydrology and hydraulics. Now, it used to be very separate. My university courses in hydrology were nothing but rainfall turning into runoff. And then in hydraulics, it was the quantity of the water on the ground and seeing the characteristics of that water. Now we're blurring those lines a bit. We are actually using our hydraulic software as hydrologic software. Um, and a quiz question for you would be, what does the H in HEC stand for? And is that hydrology or hydraulics? Um, Australians tend to use hydrology interchangeably and it encompasses hydraulics as well. Um, but the answer, I guess, in terms of the Corps of Engineers is that the H is for hydrologic. Um, and with the Federal Highways Department, if you use their HEC manuals, that is actually for hydraulic. That said, we are actually doing both hydrology and hydraulics. And thank you for those poll results. It does look like some of you have used HMS uh, for rainfall runoff modeling. In this case, we're actually going to drop rain on the grids on our two-dimensional uh, hydraulic model grid and see where we go from there. Now, I'm going to dive straight into this thing um, on my screen, this example model on my screen, which just uses free Australian terrain data. If you're interested in that, uh, just Google Australian elevation data, and you'll get to the GSA, Geosciences um, website, and you can download this uh, for free. This is near the Brisbane River, and I'm going to just walk you through the steps real quick of putting rain on grid. If I have a terrain already set up, and um, on our website on surfacewater.biz, we've got some tutorials on how to do just that. Once you've got that set up, all we need to do is add ourselves a geometry. And in this case, I'm going to call this direct precip um, demo. And when we've got this uh, new geometry set up, I can then go in and add a 2D flow area. Now on my 2D flow areas, you can come in on the perimeter and start editing this and manually delineate. What I like to do though, because sometimes these manual delineations might get lost, is once you've done this and you've got a perimeter in here, let's call this catchment. Once you've got a perimeter in there, I do recommend going in here and exporting the layer to a shape file. Then what you can do is come into HECRAS and go into the um, attributes here and get the features and you can just import it as a shape file so you can pull it in as a shape file here and grab whatever you'd like um, for example here I've got um, a catchment polygon and if I pull that one in you can see I've kind of missed the, the line a little bit so I'm in my rough approximations this is the one that I had delineated earlier, and I can just pull that in as a shape file. I do recommend that because sometimes you don't want to recover the ones that you've written, um, uh, that, you've, that you've manually entered. Now I'm gonna go ahead and open up um, some of the next screens here on the geometry. If I were to pull in my geometry here and uh, open it up, there are a few considerations that Mark's gonna talk about when you've pulled your 
2D flow area in, and you're going to use it as rain on grid. If you have anywhere where you haven't gone out to the boundary, you're going to want to bring in um, either an internal boundary condition or an external boundary condition and bring your flows in there. Now, when I edit uh, this 2D flow area, you can see here some of these parameters I've changed. Mark will talk about how we customize those and why we customize those, um, but you shouldn't just use them straight out of the box. We do need to have an outflow on our system, otherwise it will fill up like a bathtub. What I'm going to open up next then is the, the rainfall. Now, again, this is where I want to show you how easy it is uh, to add precipitation. All you need to do is take your 2D SA flow area that we've just delineated. You move that in over to this area. And once you pull that in, it will show up here with precipitation as one of your options. Now, that's very easy to do. What's harder to do is figuring out which precipitation event to run. Now, for, it looks like there are a lot of Australians on the line here, and a lot of people have used Rain on Grid before in other programs, uh, presumably in uh, XP or 2Flow or some other model like that. What ARR is asking you to do now with ensemble modeling and Monte Carlo analyses, you really need to know what uh, events you're going to run here. What I'm doing here is a little bit of a cheat, and that's to use the HMS method like in TP108, where you can take a frequency storm. I've got this little spreadsheet where I can take uh, the BOM data uh, for intensity, frequency, duration data, pop it in here, and generate myself a frequency storm. What that allows me to do then is to come in and take my Hyeda graph values, and I will just copy those here, and I can paste them right over the top and use those here as my precip data. This now has the worst case frequency and intensity, or sorry, the worst case intensity for every single duration in, in my geometry, which means that not only will I get the worst case for an individual development, which we're having a look at down here, I will also get the worst case for the catchment as a whole. So with that, the next thing to do is to run this. And as we run it, um, one thing to pay attention to is this brand new feature here um, for being able to uh, use Hecraz's internal computations to set your time step is going to be a bit dangerous. If you use that on rain on grid, it's going to have a look at your worst case velocities. And your worst case velocities in rain on grid might be in some of these really steep areas. It might not be in your channel and you might actually have uh, rooftops and things like that determining what your time step is going to be. And you might have a model that ran as a regular model in you know, 10 minutes, and it'll take 10 days to run as rain on grid if you set that up and try and use some of these velocities and uh, tighter grid spacing. So be very careful of that. Mark will talk about a few more of those things, um, a few more of those considerations. What I do want to have a look at here, though, is some of the results. When, we, uh, when we've done this and pulled in our rain on grid model, I can just now look at my results and see all these dendritic patterns going on. And what I've done here is I've gone in and set myself a 1D terrain. And if you're interested in how to use uh, 1D terrains or 1D geometries to make buildings, all I've done is just with a couple of cross sections, built myself a few buildings here. So with those cross sections now, I've got a proposed development. And this is just hypothetical. It'll take a couple minutes just to put the buildings in. And let's see what happens when we drop rainfall across the site. So when I turn on these results, one of the things that you'll notice is that uh, it looks like we've got pretty smooth results. But keep in mind, the way Hecaraz is going to compute this and display it. If I go to my render modes and have a look at this and go all the way down to my zero depth, you're going to see it looking very different. Um, and so as I move this uh, slider bar across on my results to look at my depths, it looks almost absurd if you've never seen this before. And you think, well, what's going on? Why are there so many disjointed pieces of this? Really, this is just the way HECRAS computes this. Um, you can display it any way you'd like. This does not change this does not change the computations at all. So when I do this, now it looks all smooth, but really the computations have not changed. This is just how I'm displaying it. So keep that in mind. There are different, uh, different ways that you can look at this uh, data. But the thing that I wanted to talk about real quick before I hand over to Mark is the scale that this is that we're, that we're having a look at here. So if I cut a couple of profile lines, 
Number one here, I'll do a cross section right across uh, my buildings here. And these are kind of ugly looking buildings. Um, but when I have a look at this, you can see flow in the channel. And then I've got a couple of different shapes of rooftops that I've used here as well. Have a look at what's going to happen when this water up here spills down. Hecaraz probably is only good for about up to 10% slopes. If you're looking at uh, hydraulic computations and when your normal, uh, your depth me measured normal to a surface varies from your, uh, from, from your vertical depths, uh, you might get some computational discrepancies and you will get some errors as the flow tries to go from the top of the building down to the bottom. So keep that in mind. I'll show you another cross section here. Again, just having a look at what goes on when we move our uh, water, it's very shallow. Now, one of the things that's missing right now in Hecaraz is depth varying roughness. So if I have a look at this cross section right here, and, um, and I want to see water surface elevation, down here in the channel, if I don't have depth varying roughness coefficients, what I do have is a depth varying roughness element, which is what Hecaraz would actually be modeling. Up here, for example, if I say this whole thing has a roughness of 0 0.1, up in this area, my grass would be tiny, tiny blades of grass. Whereas down here, when the flow gets deeper, I've essentially let that grass grow deeper. So what we need in order to counter that is to have a look afterwards and either delineate your catchment so that you have um, sheet flow areas with very high roughness values because of the shallow depths relative to the roughness elements and concentrated flow areas with low roughness elements, or we need to take advantage of uh, depth varying roughness. And we'll have Mark talk about that uh, in a few minutes when, uh, when we cover some of the current limitations and new features available in HECRAS. So essentially, um, I'm going to zoom back out here again to my catchment. And you can have a look here at all of these patterns. Sometimes rain on grid models take a really long time to run. Uh, because you're covering the whole catchment. One thing you can do now with internal boundary conditions in HECRAS, I could chop this up and I can take a profile line somewhere in my model, like right here. And if I plot my flow hydrograph right there, I can then take these values for my flow hydrograph and pull them in as an internal boundary condition in a model that ignores all of this rainfall. And then I could just apply rainfall. For example, I have a 2D model that's just coming in down here, or I could leave the domain or the 2D flow area as it was. So I don't want to take too much more time walking you through it. I did just want to show you how simple it is to do this. But let's now talk, uh, I'm going to hand over to Mark, and let's talk about what we need to be aware of when we're running rain on grid models. And then I want to make sure that we have enough time to open it up to questions that you're going to be uh, wanting to know the answers to so that we can spend our time on that. So with that, um, I'm going to hand over to Mark. Thanks, Craig. That you did a great job of, uh, of giving a quick overview. A lot of material to cover in a short amount of time, but you did, you did a great job with that. So adding precipitation, to the yes. there's, a, there's a number of reasons why you might want to do this. And uh, one is that is when the domain is large enough, uh, oftentimes with a, with a larger um, catchment or a larger uh, contribution from offsite from a larger catchment, then you may not, the, the direct rainfall on your domain may not be significant enough to be um, consequential, or it may have a different timing relative to the incoming flow from your major water course. And in that case, rainfall is not necessarily going to be a significant component. But where it is, then you're going to, you may be missing a, a, a significant amount of volume if you don't um, provide that precipitation on your domain. There's also a whole number of reasons to, to do this instead of doing traditional node and, um, and, and link type of approach or reach approach is when you're trying to, to identify where the flow is is coming from and, and, and propagating through your domain. An example you see running in the background is, is uh, from a, a catchment, an urban catchment, where it wasn't clear where the flows were actually going to end up in, within this domain. And by running it as a rain on grid, we were able to get a much better handle on the, on the flow dynamics within this urban watershed and look at potential measures, uh, mitigation measures for this watershed by pulling those hydrographs like Cray was showing you. Um, when you have parallel flow paths that are undefined or you have bifurcated flows like that example on the bottom of the screen, it's very difficult to, to use a, uh, a link reach or a node reach type of model 
um, because flows are, are both by, um, evolving from the channel and then also recombining downstream. Um, so doing a rain on grid model with a two-dimensional solution allows you to better capture those dynamics. So Mark, Jim Hahn has asked, any thoughts on applying rain on grid by HECRAS 2D to highway sheet flow analysis? For example, first establish 10-year, 25-year, 100-year HGL, and finally set up a proposed highway profile accordingly for the design year. Cover some of the limitations here because I think it may apply to this particular yep. that particular um, scenario that he's describing yep. because oftentimes a highway is going to have storm drain inlets and uh, storm drain facilities underneath the pavement. And one of the limitations of, of RAS, which is, is indicated here in my last bullet, is the subsurface drainage systems can't be simulated. So you're, you're only capturing the flow on the, on the surface. But if you can ignore those inlets or you're only modeling a small surface between inlets, um, it would do quite well um, at doing what you're describing. You'd have to use a pretty fine grid in order to get, if you wanted a, a significant level of detail. So just get to keep in mind what, uh, what grid resolution is gonna capture the information that is yeah. at the uh, accuracy of interest. Thanks, Mark. Can we ask this one from Chris Langham? The riverine environment looks really good visually. How does the rainfall run data set jive with any or all of the previous studies for the same watershed? Yeah, that, that's something that Mark will cover in a couple of these slides. But when we're talking specifically, again, because of the Australian audience on here, if you have results from RORB um, at specific nodes, you're going to need to calibrate the models to each other. They, if you run one versus the other, uh, initially they could be miles apart. Um, you, you, you may need to do some tweaking to be able to get them to replicate a hydrograph. And what you do to uh, calibrate one hydrograph, like for a 100-year event, you may need to calibrate it a different way um, to get a 10-year event uh, to, to match. So no, it will not, right off the bat, it will not give you the same results as hydrology software. You're going to need to do lots of playing around with it to get them to match. Look, there's more questions coming up, but we won't interrupt the presentation for now. Just hold those questions for a minute. We'll come back to them, but over to you, Mark. And, and just to follow up on, that, on that, uh, uh, that last question, the example you see running in the background there was originally run as an HMS simulation. So that's the catchment, a single catchment from HMS and the concentration point in the lower part of the screen was the, the concentration point in the HMS analysis. All we had to do in this particular instance is use the rainfall excess from HMS as our precipitation on the grid, and that's because RAS doesn't compute the losses from rainfall yet in this current version. Um, we'll talk about 5.1, but in the current version, you have to input it as rainfall excess time series. So in that instance, all we needed to do is also adjust the roughness. So when, when you're dealing with very shallow flow uh, overland flow off of portions of the catchment where it's not accumulating at a, at a significant depth, then you need to use a pretty high roughness. And in this case, I think we used um, 0.15 for the portions of the catchment where it was extremely shallow, and we used a standard roughness in the in the channels themselves where the depth is more significant. And our match to the HMS results was was nearly identical for peak with a slight offset in the time to peak. The difference being one was using a rainfall transform uh, and the other was using the, the two-dimensional analysis uh, propagating that flow through the, through the catchment. So the in input has to be as a time series rainfall excess. You can, you can only apply one time series to a single 2D domain. Cray, I, I showed a, a way that you potentially could, could um, overcome that by running different rainfall excess patterns and and query the hydrographs at various locations and then insert them as a known flow and that would be another option. Non-uniform contributions must be modeled otherwise as multiple interconnected 2D domains. So you might treat um, different areas with different soils um, or vegetative cover conditions as independent 2D domains. So some considerations when you're doing this is the, is the time series can be generated with, with HEC HMS or you can do it with a spreadsheet like, um, like Cray was describing. You can also read that rainfall directly from DSS because it's gonna get reported in the DSS tables. So you can actually pull that data directly out of that table as an input option. 
and consider that roughness that I was talking about for portions of the watershed where overland flow is very shallow, you need to consider effective roughness. So at those really shallow depths, then all of the terrain features uh, are gonna have much more of an effect on roughness for that shallow overland flow. And the other consideration is that cell property tables may not have enough detail with the default values for these uh, property tables. So what this dialog box shows you is what are the standard default values that RAS is going to um, start with is, is the screen at the, on the upper, uh, the upper um, version. Um, so in metric units, it's rounding off in the case of the cell volume tolerance tables um, to the to the to three one thousandth and in the case of, of surface area um, to the to one one hundredth. So what you're going to want to do is add um, reduce those values by one to two orders of magnitude. And what that'll do is it'll provide much more discrete intervals to the property tables for the phase properties and the and the cell volume properties so that at those very shallow depths, you're not um, overly simplifying those, those property tables. Now, that'll give you a better solution at those really shallow depths. The other thing to consider is that uh, is your grid resolution, depending on what kind of details you're trying to capture. And in these, this example here, you can see that the grid pattern does not align well with the crown, crown and the roadways. And if you're trying to capture how much flow is staying on one side of the roadway crown versus the other, you'd need to have a brake line down that roadway crown that is, is enforced because the computations are done at the cell face. Uh, what makes RAS unique compared to other two-dimensional solutions is that it's, it's doing the hydraulic calculations at each of the cell faces. The interior of the cell is treated as a volume relationship. So if, if you're, if you're, um, if, it can, if it can see a low point in one face and a low point in an opposite face, it's, it thinks that water can be transported through that grid cell to any of the low points in the opposite face. So you have to align your grid faces with uh, high points like that roadway um, crown line or any berms like in the lower left hand um, part of that example. So add frequent brake lines to capture those roadway details um, and the terrain ac accuracy is also going to be a limiting factor. So if you have a really, really accurate terrain in an urban setting, you're going to get a much more accurate solution for, for flow behaviors in the streets. But if your terrain is coarse, your, your analysis is, no, is going to be nowhere near as accurate. In that screen in the lower right, um, the, if you click on that, that uh, radio button that says read from DSS before simulation, as opposed to enter the enter table, um, that's where you would select DSS. Now, thank you for pointing to that. That would be where you would select that option. And then you'd use that button in the upper right, says select DSS file and path. And it will then prompt you for um, the DSS file that you wanna pull your data from. And then you identify which, which um, line of data that's, that you wanna utilize and um, it'll populate the, uh, the rest of that table. So in, in RAS version 5.1, we're pretty very excited about what uh, HEC is doing next. Uh, so they've been diligently working on the next two versions of RAS, actually 5.1 and 6.0. 5.1 will add a number of new features, and what I'm describing here are the new features relative to, to doing rain on grid. Um, they have a number of other additional features that will be added to 5.1. And then 6.0 will be a fairly significant uh, modification of the entire interface. In 5.1, they're going to add loss functions to the grid. So you'll have the option of using curve number, green and amped, or constant initial loss to represent the rainfall excess and the loss function. And they'll be applied as a spatially variable loss as well. So you can pick like you can with roughness polygons. You can pick, you can cre create polygons that represent um, equivalent loss parameters. Pavement, for example, if you had a park that was adjacent to a lawn uh, or adjacent to a parking lot, you could treat the parking lot as impervious and the lawn with its own loss parameters. It'll also have the ability to do spatially variable rainfall patterns, so it'd be gridded rainfall data. 
which means that every grid is going to have a different um, rainfall pattern, temporal pattern, as well as total depth. So now you have variable rainfall temporally and spatially and variable runoff characteristics spatially as well, which will make it one of the most powerful rainfall runoff models uh, available. So it allows us to take advantage of, of observed gauge data, gauge-adjusted rainfall radar data from an observed event for calibration, um, or even forecasted data products that are provided in a gridded format. So that you could be, and potentially do a simulation of, a, of a, an event that's, that is predicted by, um, by the Bureau of Meteorology, or in our case, the National Weather Service. Excellent. Yeah, I think that uh, brings us over to Trevor then. Yep. No, that's great. It, what, a, what a fantastic rundown. It's, it's a feast. Uh, I don't know quite where to start. There's a few questions on the board here. Thanks, Chris, uh, for your help in answering some of those questions as we've been going through. Uh, Michael Aflati said, could you please explain briefly what inputs we will need from the ARR to run rain on grid in Australia? Okay. Yeah, that's um, the, the inputs that you'll need. Um, really, you'll have to do all of your hydrology outside of HECRAS. And as Mark mentioned, it's, you're only going to apply the rainfall excess. So the little spreadsheet that I popped up there, I've got little routines built into it so that I put the initial loss, continuing loss, or proportional loss right into it and pull that out. So you would do all of your hydrology work outside once you know what your critical storm event is and once you've pulled your losses on to the, out of that, that's what you would pull in. So at this point, you wouldn't use it for anything more than hydrology hydraulics um, after the excess has, has been applied. But as Mark mentioned as well, in version 5.1, um, you'll have the option of, uh, of comparing it uh, with, with all that infiltration going on at the same time. Now, I, it does compare very well. And Mark's example, I think, was perfect, showing how uh, the, the HEC HMS one and the HEC RAS one lined up very well. Roar, however, you, you won't necessarily get great agreement. Um, the KC values um, it won't always give you the same results, um, and you, you do need to do some tweaking. Um, so at this point, um, you know, I use I use HECRAS as a good um, you know as a tool uh, to show me worst cases um, for the hydrology. But usually, I just take Roar results because that's what's accepted in Australia, and uh, that's what ARR is recommending. And I will put those results straight into um, into HECRAS. That's fantastic. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you, Michael, for your question about IRR. Uh, another question on screen. Um, I'm from New Zealand, from Northland Regional Council. So my question, Gray explained something about rainfall at the start, that how he captured the worst case scenario. Could you explain a little bit more about that? The other question is about roughness in 2D model. How we could apply a different roughness in water channels than on the floodplain. In short, the frequency storm is an event that will probably never, ever, ever happen. The frequency storm is a nested uh, storm that has every single worst case frequency in it. So you've got your worst one minute, your worst five minute, your worst 10 minutes, your worst one hour, 24 hours. It's got everything built into it. So it's a hypothetical event that can be used to test your worst case scenarios. Um, and um, in New Zealand, um, you'd probably use the TP-108 uh, method, which is uh, you'll, you'll get a storm like that right out of uh, heck HMS. Um, so there, there's more on that. Um, uh, we, we can we can cover more detail on that in another uh, forum. But uh, on the roughness question, I might uh, turn that one over to Chris. Uh, just to, I, I know Chris has had some thoughts before in some of the courses about uh, 1D versus 2D roughness and um, when you uh, you know what, what adjustments you ought to make. Yeah. So the thing I look at when I'm uh, considering 1D versus 2D, consider the fact that. Uh, a lot of the processes that are wrapped into the 1D N value, Manning's N value, are part of the computations in 2D. Okay, so um, there's a difference there. But the other thing to consider too, and, and Cray touched on this earlier, is to mark that uh, in uh, when you're doing watershed type 2D modeling, you can get some very shallow sheet flow type uh, effects going on. And when you get to the point where you're, you're depths are about at the same level as the roughness elements themselves, the N value tends to skyrocket. So it's not a linear increase, it's more of an exponential increase. I wish I could give you hard numbers, but uh, you know, there's been very little research. I mean, there's some out there, but uh, very little research on this topic. And so 
sensitivity, doing a sensitivity analysis and calibration, if possible, is always a good idea. Yep, that's great, sure. Um, uh, Rudy Vendry, uh, with EPA SWIM having linking tools such as PY SWIM, are there plans to link HECRAS and SWIM? <laughs> oh, Mark, you got any thoughts on that? I'm, I'm not aware of any. The, the only, only um, interface options that, that I understand that they're working on is the ability to import a grid from another model like TwoFlow or Mike um, into RAS and then be able to run a simulation using exactly the same grid pattern. But I have not heard any any uh, goals to, to link SWIM. Thank you. Um, Rudy goes on to say grid is very suited for using radar data, which is awesome for future calibration. This is a comment. Uh, that's great. Yeah, thanks Rudy, that's great. Um, Going down further, uh, Sanjay said, how can we add trim data to HECRAS and HMS? Uh, let's see, terrain data? Sorry. I think is terrain it? data. I think you're right. Yes. CRMM says it. Oh, yeah. Um, and that's uh, a lot of these things. And I know we stepped through this, um, you know, that initial example very quickly. Um, I do have tutorials on um, the website that's surfacewater.biz slash videos. You can watch a video walkthrough of any of these, um, just a few of the basic concepts and pause it at any point. So I did see uh, some people were mentioning that it went uh, a little fast. There is also one there on pulling in terrain data. And again, your, your hydraulic and hydrologic model results are only as good as your terrain data. If your terrain data missed the low flow channel, then your results are meaningless anyway. So um, we can't stress that enough, even though you know that's not really the topic of this, uh, this webinar. It is a huge piece of this topic. Um, the terrain data and the resolution of your terrain data and any aggregation that you do to it in order to be able to get this thing to run in a reasonable amount of time um, can make a huge difference in your results. So always, always, always run your sensitivity and do some sort of ground check even if it's just a photo, even if you go to Google Earth and get the street view and have a look, does it look anything like your terrain data shows it? Is the channel about as wide as you're saying it is? It makes a huge difference in your results and they'll be meaningless if you didn't use good terrain data. So um, how to do that, um, that'll be outside of this uh, presentation. But uh, again, there are some tutorials on doing that uh, in, uh, on, on my website at least. Uh, Rudy says, uh, currently, are you saying that only a single rainfall pattern and, and intensity can be applied globally over the entire catchment? Depends on your 2D areas. You can have many, many 2D areas, but each 2D area can only get a single pattern. Um, Chris, any thoughts on that? When we run multiple domains, have you tried to do spatially varying rainfall by using multiple uh, 2D flow areas? Um, I know Mark mentioned another so, thing yeah. doing that. Yeah, I know that's the classic workaround that's discussed, uh, given that you can only have, uh, you know, it's distributed uniformly in a single 2D area. No, I haven't really tested the limits of that, though. I mean, I've tried a few different 2D areas, uh, but nothing like trying to break it up into many, many small 2D areas to do a distribution like that. Uh, probably, I wouldn't think that would work so well, but you never know. <laughs> Yeah, and, let's, and, let's, and let's wait think, till five point one for that. Right, I was I was just gonna say I I, I don't know if this I, Mark if I missed it or not, but um, I saw a slide I think in the preview where uh, you had discussed some changes coming in five one, and it looked like that was one of the ones coming. That's correct. Yeah, the ability to have um, both spatially variable infiltration and and grid based rainfall. So each grid cell can be, would be able to represent a single pattern. So that, that way you can apply it, um, variable rainfall to, to a single 2D domain. But that's, that's coming in 5.1. The, the goal, the t Gary's goal for getting 5.1 out would be uh, middle of next year. Um, whether they achieve that goal, we'll see. Yep. Uh, we got a ton more questions than we have time to answer them all. So I'm just going to start picking and choosing here. Advise me, uh, gentlemen, on which ones we should aim for here. But um, there's one here that says, what are the key, adv key advantages of HEC HMS over alternatives like NAM and Sacramento? 
Yeah, and, and really what's that, what this comes down to is every region and flood control districts and others will have their own special, you know, sometimes customized values and heck HMS can be applied, you know, with, with uh, you know, almost global, well, can almost be applied globally. Um, it probably uses all the same uh, methods in their hydrologic manuals, um, but it's probably more customized for their, for their situation. Yeah. So I would always yeah. use the local um, if they've got good data. Uh, yeah. So a quick response to that is that most hydrologic models like HMS are probably those as well have to do a, a transform so you're using a unit hydrograph typically or in the case of swim you're using kinematic wave mm -hmm. to transform the rainfall excess to to a hydrograph shape and most of those um, those unit hydrograph methods make certain assumptions about how the rain how the runoff accumulates in the watershed to the to the uh, um, to the to the to the patterns, uh, the runoff patterns in the watershed, and then ultimately arrive at a point of interest. Um, with a with a two-dimensional solution, you're doing that dynamically instead of using using hypothetical transforms that may not describe the behavior of unusually shaped watersheds. So that's that's another big difference. The other is that in, in with it'll be more of a difference in 5.1 where you have spatially variable rain runoff. And spatially variable rainfall is is the ability to to not have to lump your parameters. So when you're doing a, the analysis in HMS, you're lumping all the soils, all the uh, vegetation, and all the impervious cover into a single, typically a single or or maybe just a few parameters. But you're lumping everything into into those parameters, even though it's variable all over your entire catchment. So 5.1 will offer a huge advantage because you'll have that spatial variability and you're gonna be more site specific in, in those properties. Yep, yep, that's right. Um, there's, there's, uh, you're gonna to have to help me, gentlemen, on which, which questions are next, but I'm gonna pick one here. What is the maximum, from Kirsten Adams, what is the maximum catchment area you would consider uh, using direct rainfall on grid methods for? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if I have a rule of thumb on that. I, I use it up to about probably uh, five to 10 square kilometers. Anything bigger than that, I've gone into, uh, uh, in, in, into a, a rainfall runoff model. Mark, what's the biggest you've done for uh, direct rainfall? Probably been in about that range as well. Um, it all depends, I guess, on how you're, um, how you're applying it and what uh, level of detail you're trying to get out of it. But I don't think there's really is a size limit it's it just becomes impractical because your grid size has to be small enough to capture those dynamics and when you get too large a catchment you're going to have a large number of grid cells and it's going to take a long time to run yeah any thoughts on that chris yeah. i i agree mark that's that that's the biggest thing is it's going to be your patience i mean as you get bigger and bigger with the catchment you're going to have to wait longer and longer for your model to run if you're going to have the same kind of uh, fidelity in in uh, representing the terrain, so yeah, yeah. I mean, doing a doing a rainfall runoff model with a you know two hundred meter by two hundred meter grid is not going to you know if you do that as direct rainfall, it's not going to mean it's not going to mean anything. So, yeah, that, right. that's a good question. Well, there's one here from the Bureau of Meteorology here in Australia. Steve Duggan asked, asked this question: How accurate typically is the mass balance given the parameterization of minimum cell tolerances, especially uh -huh. in large flat catchments? Yeah, the mass balance is interesting in HECRAS. Um, I, I found it to be quite different from, than TUFLO, um, where the mass balances in HECRAS always seem to be very, very small. If you have a mass balance problem in HECRAS, your model is probably garbage. But just because your mass balance uh, in the end in, in HECRAS shows up as reasonable, all that's telling you is that HECRAS knows where all of the water is. The inputs minus the outputs equal the storage. It doesn't mean that you've got reasonable results. Um, it 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 does get a little more accurate when you lower these tolerances, um, th those thresholds. But I, I, you know, we wouldn't use the mass balance as a as a single um, measure of of uh, validity of the model. Um, I don't know if uh, we, you know, Mark or Chris may have some other thoughts on uh, on the mass balance piece. You hit it very well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think I think mass balance is, is an important thing to check and to look into. One thing to keep in mind, though, when you're dealing with HECRAS is HECRAS preserves all of that volume uh, inside of the cell with the uh, the subgrid bathymetry, and uh, you tend to get a little bit more errors because of that, uh, as opposed to reducing the cell to a single flat elevation. Uh, you're washing all that out. It makes it look like you're preserving. 
uh, mass better, but in reality, you're just kind of fudging it out. So uh, keep that in mind, but it is an important thing to check. Important also to, uh, to notice with, with the uh, continuity check that RAS reports is it'll tell you how much um, volume you added to your domain, how much left your domain, how much is still sitting on your domain at the end of the simulation. So uh, water that is retained in depressions is, spe is, is specifically accounted for. Um, yeah. So you get all the components of the continuity um, calculations. Um, I would like to go to Mubasha. He's in the irrigation department in Pakistan. He's on the line. I still think. Yep. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm from Pakistan and uh, sitting in my office uh, in Lahore. I have need to ask two questions. First one is this, what would be the uh, quality of the terrain? Uh, if like uh, nowadays we have only 12.5 uh, meter dam available, is it possible to uh, model uh, the rainfall with 12.5 meter uh, dam? And the second one is that in Hakross, in Pakistan, we have very large uh, rivers having uh, four to six kilometers width. And uh, having uh, in the central portion of the river, mostly there are bellas formations. And uh, while we modeling the 2D modeling uh, in Hakross, do we have to consider the different channels formations or we can model the whole uh, width at the same time? Because in the central portion, mostly, mostly there is a bella formations. So I have these two questions. And the second one, the second is this, can we uh, connect uh, HMS with the uh, hack cross other than RTS, hack RTS? Uh, because hack RTS is a quite uh, complicated, uh, uh, very tough to model. So I'm trying these days, uh, but I, uh, other than this, can we connect that directly? We can put the in out, uh, output of HMS to the hack cross. These are my questions. Thank All you. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, let, let me just try and hit a couple of those real quick and then I'll probably turn over to one of the other guys. Uh, number one, if all you have is SRTM data, which is the free shuttle data for the entire planet, um, that will give you a good feel for the catchment delineation, but do not use that for rain on grid. Um, it will, as Chris just mentioned, store artificial bathtubs or Olympic sized swimming pools, basically of water will be stored all over your system and it, it will give you absolutely meaningless results. So yeah, five meters is probably as course as I would go. Um, hopefully if you got one or a half meter uh, resolution, that would be even better. Uh, if you don't have that kind of data, then you're probably best off with um, a rainfall runoff model, um, especially if you've got a bigger catchment. Um, as far as the terrain, when you talk about braided channels that are really, really wide, I'm not sure if I'm answering this question um, directly, but uh, if, if you ran that in 1D, for example, uh, um, the, the water can jump from one channel to the other without any losses, where 2D will preserve it in, in its individual channels and, and typically give you uh, much higher water levels because uh, it, it's got an effective roughness that ends up being much higher because of all those channels. I'm not sure if I understood that question correctly, but on the last one, um, before we come back to you, maybe I'll turn that over to, to Mark. And uh, uh, as far as linking um, uh, HMS and, and, uh, and RAS, we talked about a little bit beforehand. Uh, Mark and Chris may have some thoughts on that. There, there is a plan eventually to uh, incorporate um, the this algorithm for for uh, two dimensional analysis into HMS as a grid based run rainfall runoff model, and eventually you'll what you'll probably see is HMS and RAS uh, really coming together as a single tool. Uh, that's probably a ways off, but I want to add to when you're talking about large catchments, you have much more difficulty characterizing the rainfall patterns. Uh, when your catchment gets too large. Now you're making some very coarse assumptions about how the rainfall may be distributed in time and space. Um, so it becomes very difficult to do that deterministic modeling with very large watersheds. You may want to consider instead using a stochastic approach if you've got gauge data. That would be much preferable, much more preferable approach with a large catchment. Yeah, if I could add to the second question you had about uh, coupling HMS and RAS, uh, there is another uh, sort of umbrella program that HEC has called uh, WAT, W-A-T. I'm not sure if that's publicly available yet. I do know that they've been, uh, uh, they've released a, a version, but I'm not sure if it's just to the core or to the public. But uh, that does something similar um, in how it couples uh, some of the HEC software programs together. 
I don't think you're going to find that much more palatable than RTS though. If you're having trouble with RTS, you probably have the same with the watt. Um, obviously you can, you can connect them up through DSS. That's an option as well. Um, if you have some ability to do some programming, uh, write programming language, uh, whether it's Python or uh, C sharp or something else are, um, you can, uh, you can write scripts that will, will, uh, run the programs and share information back and forth. So that's just a few other options. Great. So I see a couple more questions here. Maybe, um, Trevor, I'll just hit maybe just a couple of these real quick, um, and just point you to additional resources so we can wrap it up. Um, I do see, uh, the question, somebody says, yes, SRTM has worked well. Uh, yes, but I would challenge you to go in and, um, find if, if you did get an area where you had one meter DEM, uh, run it both ways. It might look great with the SRTM data, but if you run it both ways, the results, I guarantee you, will be astronomically different. Um, I've done that on a few of them where I get better ta terrain data later on and my results and my whole report changes. Um, culverts, uh, no limits there. Um, we can talk about that in another forum, but I've got models with 600 to sometimes 800 culverts in them. They run just fine for stability. Um, flexible mesh and improving batch runs. Maybe Chris can make a quick plug for his book and then we'll turn over to Trevor to wrap up because, uh, yes, there are some ways you can customize uh, uh, HECRAS. Yeah, I appreciate that, Cray. Yeah, that's uh, definitely covered in the book, uh, Breaking the HECRAS Code, and you can get that on the RAS solution. Yeah, so if you're interested in doing batch runs, Monte Carlo stuff with HECRAS, and we talked about this about, uh, I don't know, five or six webinars ago, uh, and how you can do some really cool stuff with uh, automation of HECRAS. I just need to know a little bit of code, um, even something as simple as writing macros in Excel, and you can do that kind of stuff. I've just looked at the chat line, and it's gone berserk, and I'm, there's no way I'm going to catch up with that. And uh, the <laughs> Q&A has gone berserk also. So talk about a um, obviously important topic, gentlemen, and uh, everyone who's joined in today. Thanks so much. We're going to be doing a few more uh, webinars in, in HECRAS coming up, uh, sediment transport and probably dam break by the sound of it. I won't spend any more time looking at that screen. You can look at it in your, at your leisure when you when you get the video. We'll send you the uh, link to the video after this webinar is finished. We'd be delighted to see you again at a future webinar, and we'll keep in touch with you now that we've started this uh, relationship. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, especially Cray, for all the You're work welcome. you've done on this um, uh, today. So we really appreciate your time, especially in the hours that we're talking about across the globe. You go for go away for a well-earned uh, beer or rest right now. Thank you, Mark, for that, and, and Chris. I think we're there. Any other comments, Chris, Mark, Cray? Nah, just this is an amazing yeah. forum. You know, we got uh, you know this is an industry. You look at the world and what's going on it in the is. world. We've got all these people from around the planet all trying to do some good out there. I just appreciate everybody being online, and you know we we do this because we love to do it, and uh, you know. You, Tune in, uh, subscribe totally. to the blog, and um, you know, we'll stay in touch. We'd like to make these professional contacts. This is an awesome forum. So thanks for putting this together, Trevor. Well, well said, Cray. Thanks once again, gentlemen. Cray, Mark, Chris, and everyone, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.